I often ask, if you were to own this car, a BMW 2022 model, exclusive, a limited version, and this car needed servicing, who would you go to? This guy or the other guy? The guy on my left, he's a roadside mechanic. He uses his hammer, his spanner, he manually manipulates and fixes things, depending largely on his intuition and experience. And he does this hoping that it works. But the other guy, he's an automobile engineer, specialist in BMW. He has his diagnostic machine, taking advantage of technology and innovation and fixing the car with his specialized tools. And he guarantees that it's fixed before you leave with your vehicle. I think the answer is very obvious. But today, in the global stage, many are faced with the same question, but in a different perspective. It has to do with their health, their body, and their life. And against all odds, in the case of a car, when you lose a limb, you can actually replace it. But when you lose your body, or any part of it, it leaves the individual with a chronic disability that is lifelong. Today, as an orthopedics and trauma surgeon, my focus is to restore hope and to fix musculoskeletal injuries by fixing fractures and helping patients who have got joint problems. And with the help of my specialist colleagues, we are able to do this applying modern advancing technology with the use of current concepts that are evidence-based in treating our patients and ensuring excellent outcome. I remember when I was age five and I took ill, and my lovely father took me to see a doctor. This guy was a tall, dark, and he had this reassuring smile. And he looked at me, he put his arms around me, he gave me a pat on the back and he said, you'll be fine. That was very reassuring. He gave me hope. He gave me medications. I got well. But beyond that, that day, the passion, the desire to join this vocation of lifesavers was bettered as a doctor. Fast forward to today, as an orthopedics and trauma surgeon, my desire to have things fixed and reconstructed and ensure that they're working well drove me to become a reconstructive surgeon, where individuals that have difficult challenges with various forms of deformities involving their joints are fixed using modern-day technology implants doing atroplasty surgeries. These are highly advanced procedures using current concepts. Beyond this, to ensure that we reduce the size of the wounds that we create on our patients, I also engage in minimal access surgeries with the help of current technology in fiber optic cameras we're able to look into the joints, identify the problems, and fix them, and the patients can go home on the same day. This has given me great joy and reassurance in my practice as a young surgeon. But something stole my joy. Sooner or later, I found myself performing destructive surgeries called amputation, seemingly a destructive surgery, especially in children. But this time, it is in a situation it, to save a life. And why was this? It is because my patients will always resort to visit the traditional bone setter, who would then cause complications before they present to the hospital, often leading to the loss of their limbs. The traditional bone setters is an ancient old art. And these practitioners are people who have been trained and have skill and knowledge, transferred from them through generations, often within family lines. They apply various manual techniques. They use manipulations. They put scarifications. They apply all sorts of pressure. They apply herbal concussions, which often cause skin excoriations and contact dermatitis, and also go ahead to apply very tight splints in a bid to observe what we call constrictive immobilization. All this in a bid to fix the fracture. However, this is not without complications. They do not use any form of imaging within their practice and also are averse completely to the use of 
fluoroscopy, CD scans, or MRIs, hence the reason for the large number of complications. These complications occurring in this practice are often life-threatening and life-altering. I won't discuss several of them, but just for a few for you to listen. The first one I want to talk about is malunion. Malunion occurs simply because of the non-use of imaging to cause the reduction, hence it is not completely reduced and the bone heals in the wrong position. The picture you see is a patient who presented after 18 months of treatment by the traditional bone setter, but he wasn't doing well. He presented to the hospital and had this surgically corrected. The practice of traditional bone setter it's all over the world in various climes, commonly seen in areas where there are limited access to modern medical facilities. Malunion has been reported in countries like Indonesia. About 55% of patients who visit the traditional bone setters come down with malunion. And also, we have another one, which is called non-union. And this is seen in countries like India, where they have reported high numbers of those who visited traditional bone setters. And what is non-union? It is the fact that the fracture will not heal except there is surgical intervention. The traditional bone setting practice, having gone all over the world, practiced in different climes. In Japan, they are called the Sekosu. And in India, they are called the Vedea. In China, they are called Dayada, practiced by the martial artist. And in Africa, they are called Abolombolo or Osinergy for from the gods. The traditional bone setters are highly respected people in their community, hence the belief in them irrespective of the their obvious complications. Because of the nature of their practice, in seemingly poor sanitized environment, their complete obscurity with understanding asepsis and sterility, hence a high risk of infection. 93% as repeated in a study that was done in Nigeria. That's me over there trying to do a knee replacement surgery. You can see the level of applications to prevent infection. But you can see their practice table where they mix the concussions that they apply on these patients. The ultimate imp imp complication that these patients could have is called gangrene. And gangrene is seen to be a cascade of event that occurs starting from the application of the tight splint causing complications by compressing the vessels because of the not understanding of the physiology and the anatomy of the limbs hence resulting in this life limb cause this completely results in amputations as the only form of treatment to save that life studies have shown as high as 65 percent of the number of amputations that are done all over the world is from traditional bone setters practice. I'll share with you a story that changed my life. In a remote village, a four-year-old boy was playing with his peers, and all of a sudden he fell from a height and sustained an injury to the arm. He cried for help. The lay bystanders, his family members, they came to his rescue, and they took him to a nearby traditional bone setter for help. The traditional bone setter applied his ancestral knowledge and applied a very tight splint after putting on his herbal concussions. The boy screamed for pain because obviously there was no analgesia or anesthesia. Each time he screamed for pain, they reassured him that he was going to get okay. Did he get okay? Definitely not. Because in 48 hours, the young boy's hand got swollen. He was unable to move it. He was not feeling the hand anymore and there was gushing through a prolent fluid that was malodorous, and he was running the temperature. The parents resorted to take him back to the traditional bone setter, but on getting there, the traditional bone setter looked at him and said, now is the time for you to go to the hospital. I was on call, and he presented to the emergency, and this is how he came. The tears in his eyes, his hand completely destroyed, gangrenous, lost, He's going to live with this disability for the rest of his life. Those tears in his eyes shot through my eyes. They pierced a sword into my heart as I was very much emotionally affected. We resuscitated him and took him to the theater. I wept all through, if you want to call me the weeping surgeon. 
And at the end of the procedure, there he was. His vision, his passion, his dreams to play with his peers freely shattered. He's going to have to live with this for the rest of his life with the stigma associated. I would like to use this opportunity to tell us about the six danger signs, the six P's of danger, I call them, so that you look out for them whenever you have a relation, a friend, or a loved one who has a splint on. The first one is called pain. The pain we're describing is usually very excruciating and out of proportion from the pain that caused the original injury. The second one is perishing cold. We also call it poikilotemia, and that's because the splint has cut off the warm blood that flows into that limb, so when you touch it, it feels cold. The third one is called paresthesia, and that is because the affectation of pressure to the nerve resulting in numbing of that particular part of the limb, so they don't feel it when you touch it. Again, you have paralysis when they are unable to use that limb to move. And then pulselessness when you cannot feel the pulse, and definitely resulting in a change in the color of the limb until it darkens and then irreversibly damaged. So there is a call to action. Please, if you run into anyone who has visited a traditional bone setter as a choice in your community and they have a splint on, please do well to check if the splint is tight. And if you see any of those signs, please do not wait to go back to the TBS. Go ahead, loosen the splint, and take the person to a nearby doctor. Why are the reasons? Why do people visit the traditional bone setters, irrespective of all these complications? The first one is ignorance. And that's why we're having this talk today in a TED Talk. The second is the fact that they consider it to be cheaper. However, a study that was done recently showed that those who visit the traditional bone setters spend as much as 380 US dollars throughout their treatment, while those that visit the hospital spend a little less than $100. But however, even if it were to be more expensive, could you ever pay for the limb that is lost from the consequence? Another reason why people visit is because of peer pressure from families and friends who believe so much in tradition and customs and will always refer you that this is what was done during their time growing up. The last one, but not to be forgotten, is the fear of amputation. But I want to say to you largely that this is a myth because the patients usually visit the traditional bone setters first and this results in the delay pre to presentation in the hospital where by the time they come, the complications have already set in, resulting in the surgeon left with the choice of choosing to save the life or the limb, and always, will always save the life against the limb. So what is the way forward? We propose a bridge to build between the gap of the ancient practice of traditional bone setting and the modern day advancing orthopedics. We need to find a way to bring together these functions together fostering mutual respect as well as great understanding because we are aware that both of them are focused on the same thing, only that they're taking different routes. So I propose four things as a way forward. The first is collaboration. There just has to be a way to bring in these two sets of advanced orthopedics and the ancient practice of traditional bone setting. We do not forget completely that they are very much accessible and understand the customs of these people. And so there is a need to bring what they do into the aspects of evidence-based science and study them through research and bring out the best of it. And that may be able to help us serve our patients even better. There is a need for regulation. This would be to set standards, limits, so that they can identify and be able to refer once it crosses the border. For instance, a patient who presents with an open fracture definitely has a high risk of infection and such should be managed in the hospital and not in the hands of a traditional bone setter that would complicate the condition and lead to adverse reactions. The last one and the most important is awareness and that's why I'm standing before you today. I realize that sitting in the comfort of my office in the hospital that they will only come to me and so we've decided, I decided to take it as a mandate to step out to create awareness, to speak to people, so that we can influence the health-seeking behavior of our people. I'm hopeful today that having heard this, I will be raising an army from this particular talk. And for those that are going to be listening from all over the world, to be able to spread the good, this, this message, to be able to inform people so that they can make the right choices whenever they come to that crossroad. I would want to say that although 
the world leaders are pursuing the climate change to bring about control and reduce the effect and impact on humanity. We have before us in our hands a severe menace that is going out there, causing severe mobility and mortality, especially affecting the younger generation. And this has to be looked into. So I'm hoping that this will go out as a call as we build together to make our world a better place. Thank you.